Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt as we are calling our discussions with Whitman's deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. We now turn to Song of Myself, passage 13. Now we have said that sections 8 through 16 are the great catalog section, Whitman and all of the things that it is that he is seeing. We've also used the line from passage 4 of Song of Myself, which I think is in large measure a way to read Song of Myself. Some would argue the entire Leaves of Grass, but certainly Song of Myself, both in and out of the game and watching and wondering at it. Now, here we're going to turn in passage 13 to Whitman's slavery position, as it's sometimes referred to. Now, we mentioned in our discussion of passage 10 that the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, if there is a way to say that there's one worst political black mark on Americans' political history. It may be this, of course, act passed by Congress which argued that runaway slaves, if found, must be returned. It is the law, which obviously was the beginnings of the end in large measure as we know from our study of American thought, American history. The question is always, where did Whitman come down on the issue of slavery in America? Now this is a very complicated topic, as is many number of topics as it relates to Whitman as person. And when you look at Whitman's uh, life history, it's clear he was not the abolitionist that, for example, a Henry David Thoreau was. He was what we call today a free soiler, and what that means is that he was ready to argue that, a, that slavery should probably end but at some point, way down the line. He didn't want to see it as the thing that would ultimately destroy American hegemony, American unity. And yet, he's going to write stuff like we saw in Passage 10 about helping a runaway slave to be able to get to the north. Here, we're going to hear the word Negro. Now, eight times this word will be used in Leaves of Grass, and of course today we see this word as an abhorrent word, as a disgusting word, and rightfully so. In its time, it just simply, of course, qualified a black person. But notice the treatment that Whitman will give, and for that reason, it's ironic, he's going to be maligned during his life for these lines, because He's too inclusive a thinker. Today, of course, we'll see him as borderline racist with some of the language that he uses. Now, our assumptions are that you've been with us at LearnStrong.net, down the left-hand side, Talks with Walt. We gave 24 lectures on the 24 poems from inscriptions. We covered all 19 sections of starting from Pamanak, and we've worked through the previous 12 poem sections of Song of Myself. Now, passage 13 is too long for me to read and then exegete, so I'll take it in segments and I'll work with it. The Negro holds firmly the reins of his four horses, the block swags underneath on its tied over chain. The Negro that drives the long dray of the stone yard, steady and tall, he stands poised on one leg on the string piece. His blue shirt exposes his ample neck and breast and loosens over his hip band. His glance is calm and commanding. He tosses the slouch of his hat away from his forehead. The sun falls on his crispy hair and mustache, falls on the black of his polished and perfect limbs. I behold the picturesque giant and love him, and I do not stop there. I go with the team also. Now, let's just pause for a moment and point out that notice here that we're going to have someone holding fur. We've seen this echo from before. The reins of four horses, the black swags underneath on its tied over chain and put it in your notes. We're back now to, of course, Whitman pointing out that Americans love to work. That is to say, they're always busy, they're always working. He says it again that he will drive the, originally in 1855 it was the huge dray of stone, now it's the long dray of the stone yard, steady. Notice all these, all these words, adjectives that are complementing the great work that's being done. And steady and tall, he stands poised on one leg, on the string piece, this was that uh, uh, long piece of heavy square timber that was often referenced in construction. Remember, Whitman, was, his father was in construction. Whitman himself grew up around it, so he's going to use this special language of string piece here. In other words, confident, sure, 
Then we're going to get to this amazing eye. Notice his blue shirt. I mean, it's fascinating that he would point out the blue. It tells you this is something he saw. Now, of course, there are some who want to argue, well, Whitman wasn't really against slavery because as a strong abolitionist, because he hadn't ever really seen the horrors of slavery because he lived up, up north. But see, this is a problem because he spent a, a bit of time in Louisiana, and we know that he saw the horrors of the slave auction down there in New Orleans and elsewhere. So he knew, he knew, and yet notice here he's going to talk about strong, how confident, and now, and now notice the body, the physical description. And, and of course, this takes us back to passage uh, 5 as well. His blue shirt exposes his ample neck and breast. Of course, we heard about breasts already several times in Song of Myself. And loosens over his hip band. And of course, we're familiar with hips as it relates to passage 5 as well. His glance is calm and commanding. This is, of course, tributary language, right? We're paying tribute in this, in this moment. He tosses the slouch of his hat. I told you about headgear when we commented on, on the Song of Myself passage 7, and we're going to hear more of this as we go. Away from his forehead, you can see this, you can picture this. The sun falls on his crispy hair and mustache, falls on the black of his polished, and he, even, and he uses the phrase, perfect limbs, the emphasizing of the beautiful body. And there were many people who were appalled by this kind of writing, for this reason, they were ready to set down leaves of grass. We look at it today, and we, we understand that for its time, this was radical language. Of course, for our time, we'll look at this as a little bit patronizing and disingenuous, but we have to, of course, as we have said a number of times already, starting from Pamana, passage 16 comes to mind as, as he talks about the native or indigenous peoples, that we're going to have to forgive Whitman, if not forgive Whitman, at least understand that Whitman was a part of this culture, as any writer would be. I behold, of course we're back to the seeing thing, the picturesque giant, and love him. This is even more remarkable language, and I do not stop there. I go with the team also, and this idea that, in other words, he's got this almost bard-like um, eye, where he's kind of following all of these different images. And now the next part. In me... The caresser of life. And I think this is a key, and it joins back to line, uh, to passage 4, Song of Myself, and that whole thing of both in and out of the game, watching and wondering at it. In me, the caresser of life, whatever moving, backward as well as forward, slewing. In the 1855, the spelling was S-L-U-E-I-N-G, corrected the spelling. To Nish's aside and junior... Bending, and again, this this notion of bending. I mean, we we saw this in earlier texts like Passage Four. This idea of bending in Passage Five, not a person or object missing, absorbing all to myself and for this song. Now that line, not a person or object missing, absorbing all to myself and for this song, was not a part of the original 1855 edition. This is an add-on line, and I think it's an important one. Not a person or object missing. I'm going to include everything. It's almost as if he's defending to would-be racist readers of Leaves of Grass. Why are you calling a black person's body perfect? What is wrong with you? And notice he is seeming to suggest, I'm going to include everything and I'm going to see it all as beautiful. He, he says it this way again, not a person or object missing, absorbing all, and we think about on this from starting from Pamanai passage 7. I told you when we did that, that passage, that this omnis will be an important idea, a concept, all to myself and for this song, of course, song of myself. And then he continues, oxen that rattle the yoke and chain or halt in the leafy shade, what is that you express in your eyes? He's talking now to the oxen, it's fascinating. It seems to me more than all the print I have read in my life. It's fascinating the way he'll have a little passage like this, where he's obviously looked at a yoke oxen, and he's looked at the eye of the yoke oxen. By the way, notice Leafy here with leaves of grass, right? What is that you express in your eyes is fascinating. In other words, Whitman, who will later say, I think I could turn and live with the animals. Whitman wants to point out the power of studying the animal kingdom and all that animals can teach us, obviously in the romantic tradition, right? It seems to me, this is interesting as a fallible epistemological position, it seems to me 
more than all the print I've read in my life. We're going to hear about this over and over again in Leaves of Grass from Song of the Open Road. We'll hear about this as well. That experience always will trump study. That is to say, he, it's not that he's not a rationalist, but he's more of an empiricist. That is, that, what we mean by this is he's got to experience stuff to be able to know it is true. My tread, now we're going to go to birds. My tread, this will sound very much like uh, Thoreau and Walden. We've obviously given full lectures on that as well at learnstrong.net. My tread scares the wood drake and the wood duck on my distant and day-long ramble. Of course, we think about Song of the Open Road, a foot in my heart and I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me, leading wherever I choose. All of the powerful metaphors of walking, rambling, treading, tromping, they're all going to be a part of leaves of grass. They rise together, they slowly circle around, and obviously circling is one of those key symbols, and we think about Emerson's essay circle that of course was well known. And obviously in 3A, let's put it in our notes, this is a reference as well to Shelley's classic Skylark that we've given full lecture on. That idea that there's so much to be learned from the song of a bird if only one is willing to accept it. And what is it Shelley says makes the song of the bird so powerful? Birds don't know about BBs. They don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, gee, I wonder if today's the day that some idiot seven, seven or eight-year-old is going to pop me off with a BB. No, 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 no. Birds just sing right up until the moment the BB hits them, literally or metaphorically. And, of course, this is the power of the title of Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. That is to say the power of the idea that in the end we are... We're, we're, we're seeing through the eyes of nature, I guess is a good way for us to say it, right? He says... I believe in those winged purposes. And, notice we're going to have several of these ands now for our anaphoria. And acknowledge the red, yellow, white playing within me. Again, this word playing takes us back. I told you guys, this is an important line from passage 4, both in and out of the game and watching and wondering at it. I think if there's one line that I keep coming back to in Leaves of Grass, it's probably that one for reasons like this. No, notice playing within me. And consider, notice all the coloring images here, the green and violet, the tufted crown, intentional, right, that is to say the top of the head, and do not call the tortoise unworthy, so now we move from birds to tortoise, unworthy, because she is not something else. Now, of course, Whitman knew of Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and that concluding line about both great and small things all being important, he prayeth best, who loveth best all things, both great and small, right? And the J in the woods, we're back to more birds. By the way, in the 55 edition, it wasn't J, it was Mockingbird. And so it's interesting that he would change Mockingbird to J. And of course, we're going to hear more about thrushes and Mockingbirds later in Leaves of Grass. In the woods, originally, this was the word swamp as well. Never studied the gamut, that is to say the whole series of recognized musical notes, yet trills pretty well to me. And the look of the bay mare shames silliness out of me. Notice that he says that the, the, the jay, earlier the mockingbird, can sing without ever having gone to singing school. And, and we think obviously of, of Keats's To a Skylark, or Keats's Ode to a Nightingale as well as Shelley's To a Skylark. We think about, of course, um, uh, Yeats's Sailing to Byzantia. Uh, um, an aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless old Clappet Sands would sing and let her sing for every tatter in its mortal dress, nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence, and therefore I sail the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. We're playing a very similar kind of game here. In other words, birds don't have to go to singing school, and yet they can out sing the most amazing opera. And then finally, the look of the bay mare, where we were oxen before, now we're at bay mare, shames silliness out of me. And I love that he uses the word silliness because it takes us back to the idea of playing in games. I love the idea of shame because as we've said before, he's clearly struggling, not struggling, contesting. The idea of the Genesis 3 account of the Adam and Eve story that of course he knew as well through a study of Milton's Paradise Lost. That idea of shame and guilt once one encounters knowledge. And notice here, he'll say it, I feel kind of silly and ashamed when I look at a, a pony, when I look at a horse. Now, what is it that's similar in these final images is that he is learning from nature itself how amazing nature is all of the world. Again, we're back to this cataloging that will continue 
from uh, until passage 16. Now, of course, at 2A Themes Messages, nature is amazing, and it's good to be curious about nature and to try and learn from it. To be, can we say it this way, humbled? What is it T.S. Eliot says in East Coker, the only wisdom we can hope to acquire is the wisdom of humility. Humility is endless, and we're playing a game here. At 2B, the anaphoria would point it out. I want to point out this specialized language like string peaks. He'll throw this kind of thing in. We've seen this already in Leaves of Grass. We're going to see it again. Where Whitman will show you his level of expertise and he'll just kind of do it. And he didn't provide footnotes or endnotes or something to help you know what that meant. He kind of assumes you're either going to know it or you're going to find out. At 3A, well, we've already, I've already mentioned a good number of those romantic poets who love to write about birds. Shelley, of course, and Skylar Keats is to a nightingale. We'll obviously say one more time. Finally, in 3B, how about you? Do you love the song of birds? And which, for you, is your favorite? It's interesting that, for example, Whitman would change from mockingbird to jay, which obviously makes it a monosyllabic word. It's going to be fun for us to continue to ask questions about why Whitman did what Whitman did. I hope you're enjoying our talks with Walt. Thank you.